Hi, I'm Eric Love, and my relationship with Lost Nation Theater goes back, I think it's 11 years now, which is crazy to think about. I first met Kim and Kathleen at NETC's, which is the New England Theater Conference in Boston. And I auditioned for them three years in a row. And these were my sophomore, junior, and senior year of college. And finally, year three, they made a move and said, come do the complete works of William Shakespeare Bridged. And what was amazing about that is I had just graduated from a musical theater conservatory and this was a play. There was no singing to hide behind. There was quick changes and tons of crazy characters. And it was a revelation. I mean, it was, it was the first major step in my professional career outside of college. And it, thank God, because then right after that, I moved to New York. And if I hadn't had that boost of confidence from that show, I think I would have just been evaporated into New York, just assimilated, disappeared, waited tables for the rest of my life. No. The remarkable thing about Lost Nation Theater is it became an artistic home for me for seven years straight was every year Kim and Kathleen generously offered sort of life-changing projects that I, I couldn't say no to. And you know, sometimes year five or six, I said, oh man, I love this, but I'm probably gonna have to say no eventually to go to the next thing. But then I couldn't say no. It was like always the most incredible project. Um, um, I, I, the next year was fully committed. And that, that was definitely, I mean, a, a one man show to do that at 22 or three was crazy. And the nice thing about that is after that show, nothing has felt hard since. I mean, yeah, there have been challenges on stage, but nothing is as hard as 40 characters by yourself. Um, and even I got to do Buyer and Seller at Northern Stage, another one person show last year. And it's just not the same it's that amount of difficulty. It's five or six characters. And I was like, oh, no problem. <laughs> Interesting. Um, so I'm, I'm in quarantine, you know, we're, I'm at stay at home in White River Junction, where I'm the director of education at Northern Stage. And my first show, I met Christopher Shear, and we did, I don't know, six or seven, maybe eight shows together uh, over those seven years. And he is now quarantined up here in White River Junction as well with his partner, Kate Kenny, who's also a Lost Nation favorite. So it was it's crazy that they've become some of my closest friends and I, when we met at Lost Nation and now without them in quarantine, let me tell you, it would have been dark. It would have been very hard. Uh, they were the only people I was seeing. And so like we could get together and play board games and have a glass of wine on like really other than that, it was just me in my 300 square foot apartment. It's a little messy, but you can see that there's not much here going on. It's cute, but it is, it is very small. <laughs> Kathleen, what was the lineup? It was, I, it was like this a little trip down memory lane. I hope you'll indulge us. I was in Kim Bent's Hamlet as Horatio and Gildens, uh, Horatio, um, Rosencrantz, I was Gildenstern. <laughs> Rosencrantz, Gildenstern, Gildenstern, Rosencrantz. And I, I don't know, I was really excited about wearing these shoes that I found in Liz Snell's closet. And it turned out they were Uggs that were like, you know, like knee high Uggs. And they sort of had a period look because they were sheep skinny. And I'll never forget Tara Downs came to the show. And she's like, the whole show is really great, but why were you wearing Uggs? <laughs> yeah, that, that was a favorite. And then one of my other favorite backstage stories was we did the, <laughs> the comedy of errors with Chris and I, and Kim had a concept for that show, <laughs> a concept that involved like, we're just actors rehearsing a play. And then it sudden, like spirals into becoming more full on. And 
we got to start that show with the end of Hamlet, as if we were a repertory company. And so I was holding Chris in my arms because Caleb wasn't there to be Hamlet. So I was holding Chris as Hamlet and saying my lines as Horatio, good night, sweet prince, and flights of angels sing thee to thy rest. And then he'd die. And, but, you know, we'd have to be at places ready to go at a moment's notice. So I would just stand there. I'd hold Chris for like two or three minutes just in my arms, ready for that, that moment. Oh, oh, another, <laughs> oh God. You know, lots of physical comedy. And I was on a ladder. And I think the line was, I met the goldsmith for a rope or something like that. No, uh, <laughs> it was I am pentameter. So we had 10 syllables and I decided to walk down the ladder with each I am. But I got overexcited on opening and I went like, you gave me money for the, <clears throat> and I just walked off the ladder. I just, <laughs> just, and it was terrible. I mean, I hit the ground, my spine went, <clears throat> and then I was like, am I hurt? What's going on? And everyone saw me walk off the ladder and sit. Yeah, that was, that was precarious. And oh, the 39 steps. That was, that was a treat. I'd like, you know, I'd done so many women and so many funny walks by the time we were getting there. I just had to like really up my game. So I remember one of my professor's wife's walk was like, I don't know, you're just gonna see my torso now, but she like was on her toes and had hands like this and she had to twist to move anywhere. And I mean, I was just, you guys just indulged me with the craziest acting choices. <laughs> That that was really wild. And one of my favorite moments from that show, I don't know if you guys remember it, but it was in the inn and Kate and Chris were going to bed and all they had is a trunk. <laughs> and there's just this great moment of like them realizing that in this show, they were gonna have to sit, lay down to bed in the trunk and they fit. They both sort of sunk into that trunk and it was the perfect moment of just like, doing theater with that one perfect prop. <laughs> it was Clay Coyle's fault because he's like, oh, I just assumed we would use the trunk. We could put a pillow in the top of the trunk. And I was like, oh my God. But he thought they would like sit on the floor in front of it. And I was like, oh my God, if they could get in there. And I remember, I remember going up to them on a break and saying, I know I shouldn't be bothering you on your break, but, but before we go, could you just, See if you could fit into this trunk. <laughs> and that is like one of the best examples of collaboration where a set designer brings an idea to the table and the director yes ands it, and then the actors yes and that, and it just builds on itself. Like it's it's the best. Oh, we forgot metamorphoses. One of my most memorable experiences at Lost Nation was the performance in Metamorphoses because it was such a special ensemble cast. And I'll never forget the set that Clay Coyle designed for that. It was a circus Cosmo playground. It had, uh, I'd never seen this before, but it had ramps that were bent and like sloping down and sloping up to these platforms that were the stars and the sun and the moon. And he created, you know, uh, circles that we could swing in and aerial silk spaces and this ladder out of wood. It was like, it was absolutely bonkers. And, and there was a full pool with real water. So, you know, keeping that space <laughs> um, clean and, and dry, but it also we had musical instruments and it was just one of those shows though. It, I, it was like a meditation. Uh, the the uh, the storytelling was so simple and beautiful and and um, mesmerizing that you could feel the audience and the actors start to like get on the same heartbeat and just exist in this alternate realm of Greek myths and timeless love stories and you could you could hear a pin drop you know Kim Bent loves language and we found this moment together where. I was Hermes talking about Eurydice and feeling Orpheus's touch felt like an undesired kiss. And then we were like, oh wait, the snake bite is what kills Eurydice and the kiss says that, so why don't I give it an undesired kiss? And there's just like this little teeny, 
I mean, if it were like a wedding cake, that would just be like a, a small candied flower and someone would appreciate it and someone, but the, there was just nuances all over that show. And, oh, that was a good moment. Uh, Kate, Kenny and I got to be Eros and Psyche in Aerial Silks. And I, Kate was very good at Aerial Silks, I was not, but I learned from the production and I got to do a few really cool moves, including being like an angel. I think I have footage of that somewhere. Kim and Kathleen said yes to me wearing only a nude dance belt, which was a little risque. I mean, for our audiences. This audience member found me on the street the next day and was like, I saw your butt. And I, I was like, what do I say to that? You did. <laughs> but it was so artistically done. It was all sculpty lights and we were all sort of wrapped in silks the whole time. And yeah, Kate, Kenny and I had a, a nice kiss but she was dating someone else at the time who might was a little jealous. But it's okay, because since I'm gay, I, I play the gay card. Like, I don't know. <laughs> but, I mean, I worked in New York City. Um, I worked on Peter and the Starcatcher, and I, that's where I got my equity card, and I did go and work on Once the Musical, but it was as a production assistant, and I did all these things. But it was Lost Nation Theater that kept my career going. It kept my passion for acting alive. It allowed me to have a project to look forward to. I mean, because they would let us know, uh, Kim and Kathleen would let us know at least six months in advance. And those six months would keep us going. Uh, I, re I remember very distinctly Kathleen offering me Irma Bep when I was coming out of a hot yoga class in New York. And I just remember just being like, it's like this one. <laughs> And, and I, you know, basically they acclimated me to, to Vermont. I, and I fell in love with the state and I would never have taken a leap to come to Northern stage full time if I hadn't um, been with Lost Nation and realized, oh, I could make a life in Vermont. It's a, it's got a lot of cool stuff. So I had the immense pleasure of getting to come back to Lost Nation Theater in my role, sort of my new role, primarily as a director, to work on Shakespeare's Will with Margot Whitcomb and Kim Bent and Kathleen and the whole team. And it was one of my favorite projects of the year. Uh, it was a pure state of art making where we had great people striving to do very interesting, almost avant-garde art that was meaningful and I got to stay up all night working on the sound design many times. And it was like, you know, it's crazy. Like doing that stuff is crazy, but it was so exciting. I remember working with Charlotte, the, the lighting designer and, okay, I'm gonna go two steps back. I was in London and I was seeing this show called the Lehman Trilogy. And if you guys, anyone has a chance to see it, it eventually it might be filmed for National Theater Live or whatever, check it out. Um, but. In this, they had an office space and they were using these boxes to become anything. There's a moment where Simon Russell Beale sat down on, a, on, a, on some boxes and played the piano. And it was just boxes, but he was, it, there was a live pianist matching him and he was playing it so accurately that the boxes became a piano. And I think that's one of like the height of what theater does better than anything else. It, the mag I call it, it's magical realism we take a leap of our imagination and we can, things can become anything. A trunk can become a bed. And so in a really simple set, the image I was obsessed with was this idea that there was this table and that the table was here and then it had a lower bench here. And there's a trunk that we'd seen the whole show. And there, so all Margot had to do was bring the trunk over to the table and then we had this. And so she, she walked up and stood on the table, sat on the trunk and her cloak went over the picture. And in that one moment, the carriage became so clear. And it was just a table, a trunk on a table, but the silhouette of carriage was so powerful. And Charlotte, the lighting designer had said, ooh, when she's riding in the night on this carriage and the fires are burning from the bodies that have died from the plague, I want to do this. And she had drawn this beautiful sort of gesture drawing with this cool moonlight coming in one side and this warm firelight coming from the outside. And often when you're dreaming about shows, there's lots of like, you know, 
pie in the sky dreams of things that you hope will happen. And then you get there and you have to make compromises as reality sets in. We did not have to compromise. Charlotte accomplished this. We hit the gesture of, of carriage and then the light hit and it was deeply moving. But another thing I wanted to say about Shakespeare's will is in the theater, no detail is too small. And one wonderful moment about that is uh, we had a very simple hearth set and on the hearth we had items that are involved in the play or symbolic to the character. And there's a lot of story about the sea. The sea was a very, um, a retreat a childhood memory that was happy and it also claimed her son uh, and drowned him so it was very sad and Kathleen had seen a dress rehearsal and she was like something's missing because because I, I I was like I'm not, I'm not happy with the heart it's not f final and Kathleen says there's nothing from the sea there's no relic of the sea and I was like oh my god you're right and she suggested a starfish and so my stage manager and I, we went all over Montpelier looking for a starfish and we found one and it was this little burst of white against the charred hearth wood. And it was never touched, it was never mentioned, but it made me so happy. And I guarantee at least an audience member a night would see it, question why it was there, and then have an aha moment. So thank you, Kathleen, for that cherry right on the top of the Sunday. Um, and one night the stage manager forgot to set the starfish and I had been very meticulous about how the hearth needed to be set up. And he was like, how did I do tonight? And I was like, you forgot the starfish. And he's like, you gotta be kidding me. Oh my God. I was like, no, no, you gotta be kidding me. Where's the starfish? Yeah. But another, another moment that I treasure from that was the laundry. There was movement sequences in the play and we knew we wanted them to be pedestrian moments of domesticity, of sweeping the floor, of changing your clothes, of washing the laundry. And Margot uh, and I talked a lot about how exactly to fold each piece of laundry and the laundry represented each of her three children. And Charlotte did this incredible lighting that made it a, a, a dreamscape as if it could have been years of folding laundry. And in Kim, Kim made this clothesline that went to nowhere. And I just don't know why it's so um, emotional to me. Just something about the tension of a line that then disappears in the darkness. It's very sad. And we had some classical violin. And when she got to Hamnet's shirt who had, who had died, she like stopped and smelled it for a moment. And like you could just see her heart stop in her chest. And it was just like, Oh my God. And so Margot shared with me that people would stop her on the street and say they were just so moved by how she folded the laundry. And I thought that is, that's theater. Like, right, what does theater do that film doesn't? It's, it can illuminate things in the human soul and the condition of just being alive that are so personal and so intimate. So, and you know, it's it's rare. It's rare that you can get to work on a production that values those details. And The Lost Nation values the details. And that's why I love them. You know, in the craft of creating theater, there's so much administration and email and organization. And, it's, and we just want that moment of pure artistic creation and that's what we live for. And we live for sharing those with you, with, your, with you, our audiences. And it feels like there will be moments of joy and creation in the next few years as we go through this COVID era, but there's many barriers to us getting to you, whether it's the screen or a mask or a restricted audience size, and, but we will be back and we will share those moments together.